just want to say good morning and, and welcome, and thank you for being here today. It's, um, as you probably are aware, holidays are a very difficult time for, for anyone when they've suffered a loss. Um, it's the first time for some of you, and that first holiday can be very challenging. And It's a time where you really got to be mindful of yourself, give yourself a little bit of a slack, knowing that you're going to have some tough moments. And that's why we brought Kathy Fraser here today. Um, she's a local author, and, and she's experienced her own loss with her husband. How long ago now, Kathy? Well, Jack died in 2011. So that experience is um, kind of a, what's driven her to do what she does, and, and she's going to be speaking to us today about grief and how do you cope with it? You know, how do you, you know, arrive at, at the holidays and say, okay, well, what can I do to help myself get through it? And practical things we'll be talking about today. Um, just a little uh, housekeeping. At the end of the seminar, we'll give some handouts for you. Both the brochure that talks about some helpful tips, a written piece by Kathy. Um, and there's also, if you wanted to buy a book of hers, it's Morning and Milestones that will be available as well. Uh, at the conclusion of the seminar, we have lunch, which is upstairs. Uh, it's from the Brook House. So uh, I said light refreshments, but we, uh, we don't want to, we want to disappoint you. We want to overkill. Um, so we have it's, uh, it's pasta, chicken, and, uh, and some salad upstairs for you. So hopefully you can join us for that. So I don't want to take up too much of your time and Kathy's time, so I introduce Kathy Fraser as our speaker today. Thank you. Well, that's nice before you even hear anything. <laughs> I take that as a sign of trust. Actually, I take your being here as a sign of trust. It's uh, hard to come to something like this, especially now. It's very hard to choose to do it, and uh, it's very great. Um, I was saying to Dave before you all arrived that I thought it was a little bit like coming to the dentist, and you know you should do it. <laughs> I know it's good for you, but it might be hard. So I'll try. And I acknowledge it actually will be hard. Um, we're going to work together today. Um, I'll talk some, and then I'll ask you to engage with some questions that I hope just start us on the road to what you might do uh, in planning for your own holiday. <coughs> and the reason for that is because my experience of loss says it's extremely difficult to face the holidays. So my professional background and everything taught me if you plan, then things are easier. So that's a little bit what we're going to do today. I'm just going to back up a little bit so I have eye contact with all of you. Um, that way I can see better how it's going. So I'm going to just start. And the way it'll go is I'll talk a little bit, and then I'll interrupt myself and have you talk amongst yourselves. Um, so Dave mentioned my book, Morning and Milestones. And since the publication of that book, I've been very privileged. I've heard many personal stories about mourning the loss of a loved one. And the stories have a number of things in common. They're stories of feeling overwhelmed, walking around in a fog, having difficulty managing day to day, struggling with disorientation, deep sorrow, and persistent grief. And for many mourners, it's really as if the floor underneath their feet just disappeared, and the sense of who we are in the world has, has been shaken apart. Because who we are is a little bit defined by who we love and who's with us. Um, so those stories match my experiences after I lost my husband in 2011. Mourners often mention the sense of feeling abandoned by friends and family. People who love you say, let me know if there's anything I can do, anything you need, just ask. But then when you need the help, it's not always there at the time when you need it or when you need it. <coughs> and I, I think that failure to connect in those very sorry, <coughs> sorrowful times is not necessarily a reflection of any lack of love or lack of caring. I think it might come from sort of this perfect storm of grievers who are just too overwhelmed to ask when you really need the help it's very hard to also feel like, oh, let me dial the phone and, and see if I can contact someone. And family and friends who kind of don't know what to do in the face of, of a profound loss. Um, 
mourners, I think, feel that they'll be a burden. I know I did. I was afraid if I ask too much, too often, too long, they'll think of me as a burden, and then maybe kind of let me go by the wayside. Um, people who care about mourners fear intruding. Um, they don't want to intrude on your grief uh, in case it's unwelcome. So we're kind of doing this dance around each other. Um, and I hope that we can use our time together today that we'll start a conversation that might help us connect across some of those barriers. Um, so our seminar will be about starting a plan to talk with loved ones about a strategy for making the best of an upcoming holiday or special occasion. And that strategy needs to leave room for us to acknowledge our losses and for engaging with what reality is now, because reality has changed. We'll try to find some kind of balance for the difficult day and make a time where grief can be focused, the isolation of grief released a little bit, and some time for the other part of our lives to slip in. So I'm going to begin with a little bit about my experiences with loss of the holidays. This isn't in the book. It's not something I share very often. But I feel strongly about you coming here today, um, and so I'd like to do it. Uh, and, and after I do that, we'll start with the questions um, that about you and your loved one and some ways that we might make it through the season. So at different intervals during the presentation, I'm going to ask you to jot some things down. That's why I gave you the index cards. If I fail to give you one, just wave at me when it comes time and I will bring them to you. And I'm going to ask you to share your thoughts with, with your neighbor, because obviously it would be hard for us to have a conversation all together. Um, 40 people conversations are, not, are hard to manage. Um, and so the reason for the index cards is when I listen, if I really listen to you, my mind kind of goes blank. And so if I'm trying to remember the stuff that I want to say, it interferes with my ability to hear you. So that's why the cards, I give everyone a second to jot down what you know you want to say, and then if you're in a two or three person conversation, you don't have to try to remember anything. You can just, just really listen to each other. If you're here with a family group, you know, like there are three of you mourning one person together, of course you should get to make that little group. Um, otherwise, just the person sitting next to you or uh, groups of two are fine. When we get to it, it should happen pretty naturally, and I'll help where it doesn't. So, and it's my hope that those <coughs> thoughts will be useful for you to sort of get started on how the conversations will go with friends and family later. All right, that's enough of the introduction. But I always like to know where the speaker's going and what they're going to do, so now you know. In 1989, when my first husband, Bill, died, my children were 8 and 11. He died in late June, so the first major milestone day that we came to was his August birthday. Here's what I remember. Insisting we do something to honor him, having almost no success getting my children to engage with me in planning anything, and then kind of making us plant perennial flowers in the yard. I had read somewhere this was a good idea. There was some meaning for us in planting the bulbs, but none of us got much comfort from the gesture towards honoring or remembering Bill. He was not the best of fathers or the best of husbands. And I think sometimes when we're grieving, we think of grievers as the people who are only mourning those who were you know, perfect or completely wonderful, but that's really not the case. So this husband was sometimes cruel, he was sometimes indifferent. He was also sometimes fun and interesting and engaging. And when I just insisted on planting the flowers, I failed to take into account the very complex mix of relief and grief that we were facing, because they were both there. When, when Christmas came a few months later, I followed advice I had received to do things differently if possible. So we visited with extended family on Christmas Day, 
And I, I recall there was no discussion of our loss. People really didn't know what to do because they knew that he had been a mixed bag. Right? So there was nothing. On the next day, using the life insurance money, we traveled to Disney World. This choice was so uncomfortable that I donated an equal amount to our, of our expenses to the church nursery school. Um, our trip was about escape, distraction, survival. <clears throat> it got us through the time, and perhaps it was just the best that I could do for my little family. But all I remember about it was how hard it was and how alone I felt. So when my second husband died, very suddenly in 2011, I was going to do this differently. Um, we were all in shock. We were all shattered by grief. And this time there were no conflicting feelings, just a profound sense of loss and sorrow. And I already knew that these landmark days, these holidays, were going to be the toughest. So I knew to take them seriously. And that's when I started this idea of planning ahead. Because I needed time for not just me to think it through, but also time for family members to have their input about what was going to be needed and tend to share a little bit. So our first set, if you noticed, I haven't gotten to Christmas yet. But I will. Our first major set of milestones was in May. It was two months after Jack's death. And it was a week that included Mother's Day, our wedding anniversary, and Jack's birthday. I wasn't functioning well enough to pretend that I could manage on my own. And that's really the difference. I was forced to ask family members for help. I couldn't do it. And that was probably the best thing, was being forced to by my own um, just lack of ability to get it together on my own. I've always been kind of fiercely independent, and I didn't really know how you grieve with other people. Um, so this time I couldn't do it alone, and I knew I had to find some way for us to mourn together. So at that week that I'm talking about, we went to Florida, where my sister lives, and I asked, you know, I had my grandson, the care of my grandson at that time, I asked her, can you take him on the wedding anniversary day? We did a couple of other things like that, but the thing that we did together was to build a bonfire and sit in the dark and write letters to Jack. Um, we didn't share the letters with each other, we just wrote them and we burned them one by one. You know, we each kind of took turns. And nobody wanted to do this, but every person was really glad that we did it. And we were all really glad that we did it together. And that kind of got me more started on what might work. So the difference this time was that we engaged with our laws. You know, writing the letters, we wrote about what we, what we would have said to him over the last two or three months. Um, and, and and we did keep it, that part we kept a little bit private. As I said, no one read them. But, but writing them together in the same space and then burning them um, somehow had a, a mutually supportive feel to it. So we engaged with our loss, with each other, with extended family, and with our love for Jack. And so I think that's where the holiday thing begins. And that that is with the love that you held for the person who you lost, the reason that brought you here. Um, so I'm going to ask you to take a minute or two, and some of you I asked you to do this before, it's my favorite question, <coughs> to write down about your love, to just list a few things that you love the best about the person that you love. And then, and I know that's going to be hard, right? But you knew it would be hard when you came to. And I think if we start our planning from the place of what we love, what we miss, then we're able to, to, to move forward maybe with something that honors that. So that's your question number one. I wrote it down. Whoa. I don't know what made that happen. I hope I didn't hurt your ears. Uh, I wrote it down because when you're grieving, your brain turns to mush. 
So um, if I'm going to say the question, it's, it's best if it's not visible in the back. Um, it just is what are some things that you love about the person that you lost? And we'll put this together with some other things so that by the end we have a, an idea of, of one thing that we can do. And you just, we'll take about eight minutes all together for this. I uh, have this up here, which I is it turned off, but it's a clock, and I'll keep it to about eight minutes. So just jot your ideas down, and then turn to whatever little, like if you're sitting next to someone, <coughs> begin uh, sharing with them about what you've written down. Thank you. So you, you can continue that conversation a little bit. I'm not even going to ask you how it went because clearly everybody had a lot to say to each other. <laughs> there will be a Q&A time at the end, though, where you can... Sorry, I have this thing about eye contact. Did you... What, I wondered if there was something that you wanted to share with the group, um, just from, what, from your conversations. Something maybe you learned about the loved one that you didn't know before. Okay, you don't have to. That's why we do the small <coughs> conversations. But oh, but after each question, I will give leave time for you to do that if you like. And now, I just to let you know where I'm going. There's three questions. The second one will seem a little <coughs> bit unrelated, but the third one will bring them both together. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about the order, so I think this is the order that works. And I want to turn to a question that I think is very difficult to address. And I think when my first husband died, I didn't know how to address this one. As I said, when my second husband died, I had, I had less choice about it. And people often don't want to address this question because they fear it's selfish. And yet, my experience says it's necessary. And, and here's the question. What is it that you personally need on the upcoming holiday? Not what do your kids need, or your siblings need, or your parents need, or anybody. But what do you personally need on this holiday? And I'll talk a little bit about why that's the question. And I gave it to you up front because it might take a little mulling time. When, when we sustain a loss, we can become isolated. It certainly that was my experience. And holidays just sharpen and deepen that isolation. And we can become isolated even from ourselves because we're trying so hard to hold it together when inside you just feel like there's this big gaping hole. I, there were many months where I just thought if someone looked at me, they could see this giant hole. Um, we're isolated from family and friends because we try to protect them from our grief and they try to protect us. So I'm just going to expand on those two ideas for a minute. It's okay. <coughs> How many of your brains are working perfectly enough to do things like shut your cell phones off? <coughs> None. Okay. We'll move beyond that. So we feel isolated from ourselves because as we go about daily life, we actually need to keep our distress separate from our public persona. We might feel that if we let it, grief will completely overwhelm us. I certainly did. I did not want anyone expressing sympathy in the grocery store, because I couldn't handle it. Um, we might feel isolated from friends and family, because we don't know who will be able to be present with us in our pain. When you're really hurting and someone says, Oh, you'll get over it. Or, oh, they lived a good life. Or, oh, think of the many blessings you had. I mean, you want to punch them. So, <laughs> can't do that publicly. <laughs> we might not want to cause others pain by asking them to bring up their own memories that might heighten their grief or bring their grief to the forefront. And I think that just as we are reluctant provoke painful memories, or succumb to our own pain, our family and friends may just be at a loss for how to help us. They might not know when and if we want to discuss our loss. 
we might be desperately hoping that someone will mention our lost loved one. Or we might just be trying to get through the day and hope that nothing triggers our tears. We may wish to, for someone to cry with. Those who love us or care about us might be afraid to trigger tears, and so they hold back from saying the things that they need to say and the stories we might need to hear. So my intention this afternoon is to try to help us get some strategies to have to begin some of those conversations, to breach that divide, to diminish that isolation that grief causes. But we, finding a way that we can both acknowledge our loss and honor our lives as they are right now at the holiday time is just really hard. And it's especially hard to begin the conversations. So I thought we'd take it a piece at a time. And the first step is being able to, to being able to be present with others is to do what you need to take care of yourself. I, true, I facilitate a number of support groups, and I have experienced people just saying, that's just selfish. And I think it's not. Um, I think that if you don't do that, you, you can't be, it's, you know, that old, when you get on the airplane and they tell you to put your oxygen mask on first. And it's a huge cliche, but it's also cliche because it's so true. So you might not, this season, be ready for a big celebration. You might find that if you took some time alone, or a walk in the woods, or something else that gives you peace, that then you might be able to participate. You might find that if everything was scaled back a little bit, it would, that you'd be able to participate. I mentioned to you about taking my kids to Disney World, and you know all the excitement and hoopla there, just, it just made everything harder and worse. But I think if we had done something scaled back, like, you know, gone to, uh, on a camping vacation, we might, have, we might have done okay. So this question, and I will move this more forward, has uh, a bunch of parts. Uh, because it's so hard to answer, I, every time it gets loud, uh, um, I, I put some little bits to help you think about it. So, some of the bits are, do you need some time to be alone? Okay. I can do that. Um, do you need uh, to be with others? I've met people who just the first holiday just needed to be by themselves. And that was the best they could do. And others who could be with the rest of the family or whoever they celebrated with for an hour. Um, so. Do you need alone time? How much? Do you need company? How much? Who might be good to be with? And you're free to think about who might not be good to be with. You know, that person who just yeah. thinks that your grief doesn't make sense. Um, you can think about just taking a pass on that this year. Because um, you really don't want to lose it at them, right? You may be doing them a favor. So there's some balance that works for everybody um, along those lines. You might want some distraction. I, in my family, we, because I'm their mother and I make them all deal with stuff, we, we need distraction at, because we can't do it all the time. So we build in both parts. Um, one thing that I had not thought of in my younger years, but that's really helpful, is to have an ally. Somebody that you feel like you can talk to ahead of the holiday and say, look, if it looks like I just can't take anymore, will you get me out of there? Or will you, you know, take me out for a walk? I remember the, the second Thanksgiving, first or second after Jack died, I went to a house of people that I didn't know too well, which was kind of nice. They didn't deal with it, and I was really relieved with that. There still came a point where I just needed to go out for a walk. You know, and then I had asked a woman that I knew was going to be there to just watch for when I was going to need that walk, and then we took it, and then, uh, then the beautiful out there were stars, and it was a lot better. And you might, uh, this is a long question, so I'm going to give you longer to deal with it, but the, the last part is there may be some tradition that you just have to have happen, that if it doesn't happen, 
it's not okay with you. Um, that might not be true, but but I want you to think about if there's one that you just have to hold on to. And there might be some that you really could let go without any pain, um, at least for this year. Um, I will say that seven, six years out, we still do Christmas completely differently than we did it before. Uh, and it helps. Um, we like our new tradition. It, it made a new, it created some new life in our house and, and gets us through those hard days. And certainly the first year is the hardest. But I don't think you ever really get over the loss. You just find a way to build a life that incorporates it, a life that's new. And so that's, that's why our traditions have changed as much as they have, although everyone still expects gifts. So, <laughs> there are some things that do not change. And I'll give you uh, somewhere between about like maybe 12 or 13 minutes on this one. If it seems like you need a little longer, we can do that too. And I suggest the same thing where you just jot some stuff down before you start talking. And then chat at will. When you're ready, just begin. You don't need me to tell you. Is that it from? I have this whole thing that I can write your idea down on. Yes? I would like my son to be honored by my family. I don't want him to become like an elephant in the room, but no one talks about it on Christmas. So I'm thinking of having everyone say something that they love about Kevin, including his son, of course. I just want him to be recognized and honored and loved. That's really nice. Thank you. You're leading into my next question. And I didn't plant that. I should have. Does anyone else have something they wanted to share? Yeah. I have read somewhere about having to find your tribe. Yeah. Finding the people that you are safe to grieve with and to not feel bad if that's not family or friends or people that you thought it was going to be. But sometimes mm -hmm. those people are different than or are not the people you expect. Yep. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Dave is taping us, so I'm not sure if this language is okay. okay but when I was do, going to the groups for myself, someone said, we have joined a no bullshit club. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. I'll probably bleep that out. <laughs> and, uh, I hope so. Uh, so our third question is about honoring the individual that you lost and, and how to do that. Um, because we've now talked about what we loved about them and what we need. So now is maybe a way to focus on what we can do about what we need that honors that love. So have you all heard of Alan Wolfeld? Mm -hmm. yeah, so his books are wonderful. And he talks about the difference between grief and mourning. And I found that so helpful myself. I hadn't I haven't really figured out how that worked, but he says that to mourn, we must bring the painful grief that's inside us into the world. Just somehow, by a ceremony, ritual, by sharing with others, by talking about our loss, writing, acts of remembrance, music, art, craft projects. He didn't really care, but the idea that we bring it out into the world. Um, it's, it's actions that connect us to what we've lost or to others who share our loss or to our communities. And that really changes over time. I'm an upright bass player, and when I first uh, was facing trying to cope with Jack's death, I actually couldn't touch the instrument. I, I just I couldn't play because you, know, you have to stand up to do it and use your whole body, and I just would have melted down on the floor. And then maybe six or eight months later, I found myself playing this melody. Um, and I only knew it by its classical name. And my teacher said, oh, the song that you're playing is called Going Home. And it's a spiritual about uh, 
going home. And and I, it's a very simple piece, but I just kept playing it over and over again. So, uh, so like I say this because what will work for you will change uh, over time. Um, and I know um, that I did the best I could with the tools I had when my first husband died. At that time, it was like being in a vacuum. I just was trying to invent things that helped my family to get kind of from the other side of grief without any kind of guide. And we didn't know how to make room for our feelings. We just didn't. And we didn't know um, what to do to heal. And now I know that that was kind of the wrong idea, this getting by it, getting past it kind of thing. And when Jack died, there were more resources for grievers. But I still couldn't find anything that focused on navigating holidays and special occasions. I couldn't find the, in my head there would be this direct route, you know, between where I was, was, which was completely devastated and isolated, and then feeling like I could be present in my own life. Like, there was no, I thought there would be a path, you know? There's stages, you do it. But I, I didn't find that to be the case. I didn't find any clear set of tasks that I could complete along a well-charted path of healing. Grief didn't come for me in clearly defined stages, or even with much of in the way of guidelines. But what did help me, and it helped me over and over again, was creating some kind of space where mourning could happen, where feelings could emerge if they needed to. So that might have been the walk in the woods, um, or it might have been playing a song on the radio that I knew would make me cry. Um, or it might have been playing my bass with myself. Um, so the, the time leading up to the milestone days, though, the Christmas, the birthdays, the other holidays, they just exhausted me. Every time they exhausted me. But I also felt like this is the time that I need to be the most present. This is the time I need to figure out the most for my family. So that's why I wrote this book, because I thought maybe it will help if somebody else can, if, if the, so in the, the back of the book is actually just <coughs> lists of stuff that you can try, and Dave will photocopy that if, if you want. So this is not a book sales pitch. You can have, all the ideas are condensed into lists in the back. Anyway, to get back to Christmas, um, at this time, so the world is telling us, be joyful, celebrate, revel in the peace of the season, right? And if it's your first or second year, you're still trying to figure out how the world goes on without the loved one. I, most of you probably don't remember that old, old song about, you know, why does the sun go on shining? Why does the sea rush to shore? That's how it feels. Don't they know it's the end of the world? And it is. So I've spoken with many families who find that if they can make a specific way to make their loved one part of the day, that it relieves some of this stress of COVID. Because the exhaustion is coming in part from the stress, in part from the grief. Alan Wofeld says, all grievers must take naps. That's his primary prescription. Mm -hmm. So on special occasions, my family and I needed something that focused our, collection, our collective attention on Jack. If we didn't have a focus, it was really hard to move past just a sort of general weight of sorrow. But if we created a focus, it just helped us to have a part of the day that was about our loss and then a part of the day that was about our current lives. And I will say we got better at this over the years. The first year, um, I pretty much just survived the day. But we did some of these things anyway. So I'm gonna give you some examples um, to speak to specifically what you were talking about. How do you acknowledge? Just to get you thinking about the idea. And then, uh, then the third question will be what thing is it that you want to do? So one of the easiest things to plan, and that you get not really a lot of resistance for, is just to make a toast. So in my family, when we're eating, we, we you know, raise our glasses, whatever age, and we say two, and then we 
So each person says the name that they had for him. So I would say Jack, and my grandsons would say Papa. Um, others would say Dad or Uncle Jack. Uh, and somehow it breaks the ice for us. And it, it makes it so that later if someone wants to share a story, it just feels natural. Um, and if, if you get talking about something else, it feels natural as well. Other families that I know light a candle. Some of you may celebrate holidays that go across a number of days. Um, and they light a candle each day if it's a multi-day holiday and just let it burn all day in honor of that person. So when you go by the candle, you think about that person and there's a little bit of their presence. Not, I don't mean in some mystical way, although it may be spiritual for you, but just that it that recognizes them. We used to try to serve Jack's favorite foods, but it, it was herring and, <laughs> Not a good idea, but I suggest that as one that you might try. Um, this Thanksgiving, I baked my mother's rolls, and it was really satisfying. Uh, closer to her death, uh, I couldn't do that. But this year I did, and it was, actually it was very good because the turkey didn't get done for hours late, and there were, we needed the rolls. <laughs> so some families also perform acts of service in a loved one's name. Um, and especially the first year, that can help a lot. A lot of people just go to a soup kitchen, you know, and and don't try to do their thing at home. I used to donate an age-appropriate gift to honor a nephew who had died. So each year I would give give a gift that would be the year of his age, that you know that he would have attained by that year. Um, two other ideas that might inspire you come from a man that I, I interviewed him for the book. He created photo books for people out of his family. He insists to me that it's very easy to do that. But, but in the book would be, it, it was his wife who had died, so let's say he gave his daughter a book. It would be filled with photos of his daughter with her mother. And they, you know, they weren't big books, but little, um, and it helped a lot. And then I met a woman who, she, she was not a sewer, but uh, this kind of gets back to the making something. She chose all of her favorite t-shirts that her husband had worn, and she met with a person who was a quilt maker and, then a qu and showed her where she wanted the shirts to go, and then the quilt maker put together this quilt of the t-shirts. And so when she's blue, she can wrap herself in that. Uh, it's a lovely idea. So if you want more ideas, you probably can give them to each other. Not, I'll be happy to photocopy a list out of there. But your third question, and, it, and what, what you choose to do should reflect the love that you have for the person. So it's what concrete thing can you do to honor your loved one? And we'll follow just the same format that we did before. Glad to have it. <laughs> so I, I don't have an extra mic to give her. her what, what she does is uh, she collects angels, so each year uh, gets a new angel for the person or people. A person, yeah. One person who, who she's lost, and now there's a collection of those angels that kind of can help this person on their journey. Does someone else, I'm going to write that one down. So you could do that with anything. You could buy an ornament, right, that, that went on the tree. Um, but I'll write down the angel because you all know that's what she meant. Mm -hmm. Do we have others that you thought of that, you, that might be a good way to honor? I, uh, my husband was cremated, so and my son built a beautiful box for him, and uh, and then on top of it is his picture, and uh, it's facing the TV because he always liked. <laughs> Should I repeat that so far so everybody got it? So she's got this be a beautiful box that her son built um, to hold the cremains of her husband, and it has his photo on the front, and it faces the TV because he likes to watch TV. <laughs> and over the years, um, I have, my husband and I were married 60 years, my guess, and we always gave each other cards for our, the anniversary of the Christmas meal. 
they always brought beautiful cards, and I never threw any of them away. So come Christmas, or when it was his birthday, which was a couple weeks ago, I brought up one of the cards that I had given to him, and I have it set by his box. And then at Christmas, I already have a card picked out <coughs> from each of us, um, and that's sitting in front of his box. So it's a card that he gave me and a card that I gave him. And then there's always a candle. That's so beautiful. I'm, I'm going to repeat it to make sure everyone heard that. So over a 60-year marriage, her husband and she exchanged cards for birthdays and holidays and Christmas. And so on his birthday, she put the card, a card out of the many that we saved next to this box from you, right? And then for Christmas, there will be cards from everyone and to everyone. That's just a, a beautiful one. I've never heard that before. I'm just going to write down cards so I don't take too long writing. Them. Does someone else have one that they want to share? Yes. Um, I haven't done this, but I was thinking about a collage because I've actually seen that before, where you take objects of your loved one and you display them in. Most anybody can do that. A collage. Yes. That's the spell mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she's suggesting that taking objects from the person who you lost and, and making a collage of them so that you have something to put up that's uniquely them. Pardon me? That, that is then uniquely them. The stuff was uniquely his. Yeah. Does anyone else want to share one? I love this because these are ideas I hadn't found or um, heard of. I think art, um, um, my daughter is sending me a photograph. I do artwork mm -hmm. and um, her closest friend had a 17-year-old daughter that passed away. So she asked me for Christmas, would you do a canvas painting of her? So that's mm -hmm. something yeah. else. So she's an artist, and she'll be making a canvas painting of, of a loved one that would die. Um, that's beyond some of our <laughs> But you can ask someone. Even if it's well beyond yeah. you can ask. I think Yes, I can share another one. Sure. <coughs> um, my husband died in October, and um, I was at home care, at home. And I had a, a glass sunroom and my uh, sliding doors in the kitchen go out there. Well, and friends had said, now look for a sign. That might be a sign of him. So there was this branch that was out on the lawn. Through the snow or the wind, it stayed there from December 1st until I asked my neighbor, uh, to, to take it in, I would not enter. Because that's what helped me get through Christmas. But I said, now that I have this, what can I do? So my friend and I got a, uh, a vase, we stuck it in it, and it was from a butterfly bush for my neighbor. And my husband had seven surviving children. And on this branch were seven of the butterfly flowers, dried flowers. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, this is like, and one is in repentance, one, one was bent down, so I don't know. But anyway, I took one of his bow ties, I took a glove to put on, you know, the other branches, and then <clears throat> surrounding it in the pot, I took two of his golf clubs and, and put two of his hats on it that were we had been. And then in the uh, thing, I got um, golf balls and his sunglasses <laughs> hanging. So, and this has been like a monument, sort of. <laughs> and, you know, really, it, it's amazing how something like that worked out. I mean, I just think it's so, I don't know, it was meant to be, because why would it have to seven things? I think All everybody things. heard her, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I won't repeat it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we, we probably have time. To, I love it. We probably have time to share one more, if you wish. I dried the flowers from the service and put them in, um, he died in September, and put them in a clear ball um, with a little silk monarch butterfly as Christmas ornaments for our kids and my nieces and nephews and his siblings and several other people who were So I don't, I don't think everyone heard that one. She took the flowers from the service, dried them, and put them inside clear balls with 
a monarch butterfly. With a butterfly and a string so that they could become Christmas ornaments for everyone else who loved them. Yeah. Uh, these ideas are amazing. Um, <laughs> but it's so much more because it's the flowers and the, and the way to save it. Uh, Dave's in the back, so I think uh, we'll have to continue over lunch if you wish. I will be staying around, but I do want to just say something in conclusion, and that is that I hope that you have been able to make a plan that's going to work for you this holiday season and just makes it just a little bit easier. I think that's I, I think that's a reasonable goal, is to make it a little bit easier. And I want to say that the depth of your grief and the tears that you shed are just reflections of your love. And the, the love that you hold for that departed loved one, the love and the memories that are part of it, are, they're sacred parts of who we are, those, that love that we hold, the memories that we hold. And I want to be sure that on this holiday you get to value those. Um, and so it's my hope that a little bit of planning will help it so this season you can share the grief and the love with those that you love. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One last announcement. Uh, you notice there's a video camera here. So we have recorded it. Um, we'll put it on our YouTube channel. If you want a link to it, just email me. My, my email is just dave at bridalamail.com. So send me an email and I'll send you back a direct link so you don't have to go searching all over our YouTube page looking for that video. So give me a couple days to put that up and I'll get it up there for you. You can watch well, any part of this again. Thank you. Dave at bridalamail.com. So D A V E at bridalamail. So I'll get that over to you, and um, you can watch this. We also had we also had a seminar this fall on cremation. We had a seminar on uh, having funeral ceremonies in the funeral when you don't go to church, and we also had one on pre-planning. Those are also on our, our YouTube channel as well. So.